afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. Welcome. Um, welcome to all my wonderful creators here at the table. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for being here. So um, maybe first I'll just ask everybody to introduce themselves and uh, say a couple words about, I don't know, what they ate for lunch. I uh, know. <laughs> you know, maybe just a couple words about the festival and, and your experience here so far, and then we'll open it up for questions because this is all about really trying to be responsive to what, what our audience uh, is interested in. So, Jonathan, why don't you start? Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm Jonathan Newman. Um, you know, as far as the Cabrillo Festival, it's this, when you're coming up as a, uh, as a student, it's, as a composition student, it's this mythic sort of um, uh, mecca <laughs> e event that, uh, you know, you watch with awe from a distance and, um, and uh, so to be, to be part of it, there's still that sort of like a uh, 22-year-old in me that's, um, that's still a little uh, freaked out that I'm, that I'm actually here. Um, and that was longer ago than you'd think. Um, but uh, to, to the orchestra is, you know, that it's the finest in the land for what they, for what they do and to watch, to watch them be so uh, prepared and and to, to observe Marin know every score inside and out, it's just, it's, um, it's an honor. Oh, that's nice. I thought I'm fooled again. Um, so, and, uh, <laughs> Sebastian is also uh, brand new to the festival, so welcome to you. Thank and, you. Uh, both Jonathan and Sebastian, well, everybody, let's see, uh, know this side of the table, their pieces are tonight, and then uh, Nathaniel, both of his pieces are on Sunday. And David was last night, so just to get, get you acclimated. So, so um, yeah, so it's been really great to be here. And of course, the orchestra is amazing, so that just my personal experience working with the orchestra with Marin is fantastic. But the other thing I've been enjoying, because I think it happens less and less, maybe when you're in school, you go to a lot of rehearsals and hearing stuff. But these days, oh, you're not hearing me, sorry. Um, when, when it's been years now, these days you go to an orchestra. You have a piece played, you come in, you go to maybe one rehearsal, you maybe talk to the conductor a little bit, you leave, it happens. Um, but, but here it's been great to hang out with all of my colleagues. We all tend to know each other and get to hear pieces rehearsed and hear the details and stuff. I feel I learn a lot from that and it's been really fun and it just hasn't happened for me, I don't know you guys, but it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, it's really fun. It is nice, isn't it? And Juan, we, uh, we welcome Juan uh, Roll back. But Thank you've you. been here twice or just one other time? Uh, this is my second time. Second time back. And Juan uh, also was in uh, charge of, responsible for the composer's workshop. So he selected the three pieces that the conductors worked on and performed last Wednesday. And uh, he, had, he was telling me there were 175 applicants and he had to pick three of them. So he was very happy that I liked all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Juan. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, my first experience was uh, three or four years ago, and I was uh, singing in my uh, Chinese folk rock piece with Mary conducting, and that was so great. Uh, after that, I know what this orchestra and what this festival is capable of, so I bring in a, a, a more challenging piece this time. But the orchestra is fantastic, I have so much uh, great respect for being uh, the festival and uh, um, every day I'm just counting down, oh, one day less, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, being here, to me, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, energy-oriented person. I like to uh, um, ju just, uh, I, I feel the energy here is so uh, positive uh, for com uh, composers, for performers, for audiences as well. So it's a great harmony here. Um, so it's great joy to work with the younger composers and uh, who are uniquely different from one to the other. And uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, selecting their music, I also actually uh, went to uh, uh, each of their website as well, just to get to know them more and to hear their other works. Uh, so that make, uh, you know, to able to uh, work with them closely before I meet them, I know them. Uh, so I hope this experience uh, will just be a um, testament to many great ones about how great this festival, how great uh, working with Marin and the orchestra is, and um, hopefully uh, you will uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Yeah, thank you. And David, welcome back. Good to David you. was uh, here um, 12 years ago uh, as a, 
uh, participant in the composer's workshop. So uh, it's nice to see that there is a future after the yeah. workshop. Yeah, definitely. And then the following year I was back uh, on the festival. I had a piece called Screamer, uh, which is very different than the piece that was played last night. Um, and yeah, it's just been a great, it's, this festival is amazing, the orchestra is amazing, and it's so nice to be able to bring, bring my work back to Santa Cruz, and especially a piece that is so drastically different. Um, you know, it's sort of like, there's faith in the, in the artist, uh, whatever he or she may do, uh, which I think is really special about this place, that you, you do feel like you have a relationship with the community and the festival and the orchestra in Marin. It's really, it's really unique. There's really nothing else like it, so. And, uh, and Nathaniel, we're playing um, uh, his piece at the family concert on Sunday. I think it's really, it, it, I know you didn't write the text, but the, I think the musical, uh, the language is just brilliant, absolutely brilliant in the way you weave everything in. So you have to hear that piece. Um, it's one of those, it's when you go to a great movie, you know, you take your kid to a great movie, but you really enjoyed it a lot. It's that kind of piece, you know, the kids will love it, but adults. And also we should say that um, one of your pieces is being performed by Kronos Quartet on Sunday night. So if you want to say something about that too. Um, yeah, I, I'm from San Francisco, so Santa Cruz has always been kind of a like, vacation destination for me, at least coming in the summer, so it's great to be here. Um, I tend to like to alternate between different types of projects and rarely work in the same medium more than once. So the, the quartet is a nice uh, change. And um, Kronos, of course, comes here regularly. And the fact that last time I was here was uh, maybe, anyway, they were here as well. And they had just commissioned me. So it's a nice connection for me because I remember being here at the moment they had commissioned me and now getting to come back and hear the piece that they commissioned is kind of nice. That's great. So let's open it up to questions because I know that's uh, what you all come prepared with. But the first one's always the hardest. No question, I can, yeah. Yeah, no, I promise I'll repeat the question, okay? Yeah, the question is about what um, Sebastian said about having this experience of learning by being with uh, many other composers and if he could articulate that and what the other composers think. You know, I, I just will say that for conductors and composers, it's usually a very solitary, I mean, much more so for composers even than conductors, very solitary existence. And so it's rare that you, you know, when your piece is on a program, everybody else, everybody else's piece, they're, they're all dead. Um, I mean, there's not going to be another living composer and, except for a place like Cabrillo, so you never have any company. Um, so I think that's what's not, I love watching the composers hang out. They all sit at a table in the rehearsals, if you've been, you see them um, listening to each other's pieces and talking about, I don't, know if, I don't know if you even have to talk about anything, you're just sort of assimilating, but... Right, I mean, I, I wish I could give you something more specific, I don't want to sidestep you, but it's a, more, it's a more general thing where you're hearing this rehearsal and it might be some things like, oh, that flexitone, that worked really well there. Oh, this, ah, oh, look at that, ah, oh, that's kind of awkward, isn't it, with that spacing there and the harmony. And you know, you're getting to see Mary take it apart and try, and you see, oh yes, it gets fixed simply, or oh, that's really difficult, or, and stuff like that. Um, and so, and every composer, you know, orchestration, it's like, it's, it's complicated, everybody has different approaches, and you know, there'd be something to be a very rather, simple doubling that maybe I wouldn't use, but I think, wow, that sounds great, you know? <laughs> maybe next time I will do that, you know? So things like that, but it's, there's so many little scattered things. So it's just a sort of about watching that go by, and you know, some I remember, some I probably, I don't, the ones I don't remember are the probably ones I end up using, you know? Right, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so something like that. And everyone's language is so different. Very that different. I think that's, that's, that, right. that's what I was gonna say, is that everybody's Exactly, language. that's why you learn from that. Right, yeah because the approach is so different. And I think, you know, everybody's of a, of a you know, in, in, in a place where you look at uh, something that you would never in a million years write yourself or even know how to, right? And you appreciate it and, and you know, uh, learn from it and, uh, and everybody sort of, everybody gets that, I think. 
thank all the, the composers. I think that's part of the, the camaraderie that, that uh, Sebastian's talking about. Also, you know, you know, in many cases we went to school together and we rarely, you know, everybody, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, we all kind of know each other anyway. <laughs> but it's, it is nice to have an opportunity to, to, uh, to hang out together. No, for, but three of you teach together. I just found that out, right? You. Well, Dave, yeah, I just, I just succeeded uh, David at uh, Shenandoah Conservatory. I just moved into his office. Special. No, no. Who's no. there? Wait, it's all these. Were there? No, so you're so you're right. Right. Yeah, and Mason and I. And yeah, we were at Juilliard together. And, and, and then, yeah, and then Juan Luna are now yeah. both <laughs> teaching in Madison. <laughs> yeah. So, so I just. Like, <laughs> so yeah, so I just. I think you're the only West Coast person. I'm sorry, you're kind of out on the limb there. I don't know. But he's guys. totally mellow, so it's good. <laughs> well, uh, yes, go ahead. Doesn't Where work did anymore. you grow up? When did you start to be inspired by music? And with whom? Where did you grow up? When did you start to be inspired by music? And with whom? Yeah. Who, uh, who inspired you? Yeah. Okay, should we start? Why don't we start here? I was uh, born and raised in San Francisco. I would say I started to become inspired playing in the symphony's youth orchestra. Uh, and other youth orchestras, actually. What's your instrument? Violin. Violin. Um, so, I was, as I was realizing I wasn't probably going to be a good enough violinist, <laughs> I was also realizing that I really liked everything that was going on around me. And when did you start? How old were you when you tried to compose? I, this is always curious to me. Well, I made a few minor efforts when I was young, but 16, I really started composing. I really realized, wow, I'm not really a great violinist. Maybe there's something else I could do. And that was 16. And I started writing a lot. Oh, that's cool. And David? Uh, so I grew up in a town called Blairstown in New Jersey, which is probably most known for being the filming site of the original Friday the 13th movie. So I grew up like a mile from the campsite, which is a little spooky. Um, and I first started playing music um, sort of officially when I was eight years old. I joined a fife and drum corps and played snare drum, rope tension snare drum, playing colonial and civil war music. Um, and that was really what I did for many years when I was 15. Um, and you know, that I learned, you learned all by ear and by rote, so I couldn't read music. When I was 15, I went to see The Nightmare Before Christmas and sort of fell in love with Danny Elfman's score and I walked out of the theater and I said, I'm gonna be a composer. That's a job that people can do. How exciting. And then I needed to figure out how to read music and <laughs> do all the, like, the details that go into that. Um, and so yeah, early on it was just with, um, with the people in the Fife and Drum Corps, just other kids. And then you know, from the, when I started looking more at composition, it became a little more solitary because I was trying to figure out what does that mean? How do you do that? Who do I talk to? And they're really growing up in rural New Jersey before the internet, or the very beginning of the internet, it was really kind of hard to track it down. Um, and so eventually I kind of found other people who were interested in it and kind of have just been continuing to do that ever since, really. Uh, so my father actually is a composer also. So I remember when I was very little, he always tell me you are going to be a composer in the future. And he tried to teach me, which never works. We always argue this and that. And so he got rid of me when I was 12. He sent me to Shanghai Conservatory of Music to study music, that, where he also got trained. He said, OK, I'll let my teacher to train you. So, uh, so that starts my journey to be a composer. But actually, uh, one story I want to share is uh, uh, I grew up playing the piano. And you know, uh, every semester, there's a recital you have to memorize. Uh, I played Bach. I really hated Bach at that time. <laughs> so many, so many fingers have to a lot, a lot of notes, and if you make one mistake, yeah, it's all, all, all over. It's all over. Right. All yeah. <laughs> so, so my teacher told me two things. He said, you know, number one, do not stop. No matter what you do, don't stop on the spot. Number two, do not go back to the beginning and restart again. Just go on, no matter what. So I improvised in the style of Bach. So I came down, I had terrible stage fright, and nobody noticed except my teacher. So she told my dad, say, you know your son won't make a great pianist, but he can improvise, so let him go to composing. So anyway, so that was my, uh, my 
little secret. <laughs> That's good. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, actually Huang and I were talking about this because actually my mom is a composer um, and my brother is a composer. My dad was a violinist and violist. So I grew up in this very musical family. And I remember early on, my dad, same thing, sort of tried to teach both my brother and I string instruments and failed miserably. And so he left us to our own devices and then we started this rock band. And I think we drove him crazy with these big martial amps, you know, in, in the basement of the attic. And, and, um, and my brother, this is my brother and I, we were totally into it. Um, but my parents had this collection of records because they're both classical musicians. And as time went on, my brother and I, we both started listening to this music, as much as I love the pop music we were doing, there was always this thing of this wider space, you can go anywhere, just some, something about it that had, had to do with this idea of journey and the sort of expressive breadth of classical music. I was hooked ever since, it's probably as a you know, young teenager or something like that. It's a great story, it's hard to talk. Um, I grew up in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, and um, I was mostly, I was first interested in jazz, and the first, in fact, the first uh, theor music theory I learned was jazz theory, and sometimes I still, it's the first instinctive thing that I, that I think, but then I was uh, sent to, um, there's this program for young uh, composers at uh, Tanglewood in Massachusetts in the summer, and um, when I went there and I pretended uh, to know everything else that the other people knew, uh, and, and I, you know, they were talked, I didn't, you know, then I discovered who Schoenberg was, and, and uh, you know, listened to Strauss for the first time, and and uh, and I caught up quick, and I, I caught the caught the uh, I, I never never looked back after that. Yes. Well, I wanted I wanted to thank you for your piece last night. I really enjoyed it. Says thank you for David's piece last night. And I think the beginning, particularly, was really really captivating and I love the subtlety of that. And I wanted to kind of follow up on what you were talking about and um, ask each of you to, um, if you would think about what you see as your own particular musical strengths and if you're willing to go there, what you see as your own musical weaknesses and how that forms your either composition style or how you approach looking at music. Did you hear the question that if you if they would each speak to um, if they're interested in, in divulging this their their what they consider their musical strengths and weaknesses and how that um, impacts their composition does that make sense? Well, okay, with me now. first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was hoping to leave that for. <laughs> Keep you guessing. Um, well, I could go weaknesses really easy. I mean. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I struggle to constantly remind to um, you know to constantly remind myself to think less about notes and more about sounds. Um, that's a that's a something that I'm constantly striving to to do. Um, I don't know that the distinction see might seem weird, but I think everybody at the table uh, knows what I'm talking about um, at least. Um, and uh, strengths. I feel very, very comfortable um, orchestrating, and um, I feel like it's it's one of those things that um, it, it, it feels easy to me. So I have to remind myself that um, that just because it's easy for me doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Um, hmm. Uh, uh, good, good question. Because I had I really. Not sure I look at things that way where it would be about strengths and weaknesses in that way. And what I'd say, so I'm sort of um, answering your question, I think, is that one's always trying to do things that one never fully succeeds in doing, right? Every piece is that. Um, and so that brings up sort of certain failures and certain things you're successful in. And I'd say for myself, probably, I usually try in each piece to do something different that acts as a challenge. Um, so, and as in sort of general, I'd say, yeah, I don't know, many, many failures, you know, hopefully a few successes. I mean, that's, that's the way it goes, really. It's hard, that's yeah. really hard to answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, in similar suit, it's hard to say that, but uh, I always feel um, uh, being a composer, the hardest thing is to find inspiration. I think that's the strength and also that's the weakness of being a creator. 
uh, I feel thankful so far. It's like, you know, there's a well, so the well of my inspiration still has some water in it. I keep digging water out. So I told myself, if one day the well is dry, I'm not going to force myself to uh, put water in there instead or to <laughs> keep digging. So, uh, so that's the blessing, and I, I hope to be able to keep creative. Uh, it comes in a great price because uh, every day you face that pencil and paper is solitude, it's a lot of loneliness, especially when you have a family and uh, you always feel you're doing something terrible every day by not being with your family when you are close the door and composing. Anyway, so I hope in the future I could make back that lost. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's a tricky question uh, to answer. I mean, I think sort of like what Sebastian was saying, I mean, for me, I, I can talk about what I've struggled with over the years, and I think one of the early things I struggled with was really being honest um, with who I actually was creatively at my core and sort of getting rid of the lot, a lot of the noise about what new music is supposed to be. And I think especially coming up in school, you know, you, you sort of, um, you first encounter certain composers who are either very complex or very gnarly or very whatever, you know, very intensely minimalist or any, any kind of thing and you say, okay, I'm a student, I want to be what they are, and so I'm going to assume that what they are doing is the right way to do it. And I, it, for me, I got very obsessed early on with the sort of modernist aesthetic, um, which is great, but is also not really me. And so for many, many years, I, I've been sort of, and, and the piece we heard last night, I think is a great example of a kind of stripped away version of that that still has elements of that in the construction but is, is a more true uh, statement, I think, of who I am creatively. Um, and along those lines, I would say I'm also really interested in, in continuing to grow. So um, techniques or aesthetics or sounds that I perhaps haven't worked with before, I'm always interested in learning more about them and digging into uh, repertoire that I don't know. And, and that sort of, when taken with the, the sort of honesty um, pursuit will hopefully continue to to push the work in a, in a good direction. So I hope that kind of answers the question. I guess I would have to say that as an orchestral musician and a violinist, my thinking is very horizontal. I think in terms of line and, and voice and so my strength is also my weakness, that I tend to think that way, and unlike people who have a more vertical kind of thinking where they think in terms of event, sequence of events, um, I am more like you know, 40 people wandering around in a thicket trying to find my way out, which can have its disadvantages. It's interesting to listen to you, though, because I I imagine, I, I wonder, I have a question, is it, um, has, the, has the internet impacted how you compose? Or is it reserved more for the um, business aspect of music? I'm, I'm just curious, I mean, it, you know, do you, because you have access to so much more music, so many more things. Do I, do I start this one or does? Oh, it yeah. Oh, that's right. It's oh, your I don't. Turn. I mean, no, it's your turn. <laughs> I, I can tell you. I have. A, I have a strong answer for this one. The way it's impacted the way I compose is that it's a nuisance that I'm always trying to get away from. Um, I have gone to all kinds of lengths to wall myself off from the internet, working in places with no Wi-Fi. Um, setting up like complex parental controls on my computer so I can't be distracted by it because it's always there. And I'm sure there are positive aspects of it, but for me it's just been like being hunted by this thing that I'm constantly wanting to pay attention to at the same time. You mean because it's like such a, a so, such a magnetic draw yeah. that you feel it's yeah, like it's an addiction. Obsessive and addictive for me. You know, I mean I want to hear everybody I just want to share I recently I I often conduct the finals of the Queen Elizabeth competition. This this year it was violin. And uh, they have a compuls what they call a compulsory piece, which is a brand new piece that's written for the contestants. And they're taken to a chapel out in the countryside where there's no Wi-Fi and they have to hand in their telephones also so they have no devices whatsoever 
and, um, and they just have five days to learn a piece, and they only have each other to rely on. And, uh, you know, it, it's so interesting, even over the course of, I've been doing it for maybe six years or so, uh, even over six years, I've seen the, um, the change in the young people that, uh, this year, I, I mean, some of them seem to be in severe withdrawal. No, you know, they didn't, they don't even, they don't, kids don't wear, I didn't realize this, they don't even wear watches anymore. You know, they, everything's the phone. So when you have to give up your phone, you know, they, and after, I, I saw them at the beginning, at the end, at the beginning, really, they didn't look well at all. And at the end, it was great. I came in and they were all playing pool together. You know, instead of like when my kid's at home with his friends, they're all sitting on the couch online together. You know, it's sort of like this. But it's so interesting how it just in a few years even seems to have become such a part of what they, what they do. Uh, I mean, I was sort of thinking of from a different perspective. I mean, for me, it's just an Im immense resource to be able to learn new things. I mean, the amount of music that we can access now immediately is, I mean, it's never been like that, you know. so. I can be working, and, and this is often the way it is for me, you know, I'll be working on a piece and say, oh, there's this, you know, this is an interesting thing, and this composer I know of does this, can I find his or her piece online? And immediately, most often I can, and then I can sort of learn from it, and then I can take whatever I was trying to understand from that and work that into the piece in my own way, so. This is much healthier. <laughs> well, but then there's also, you know, like, resisting checking Facebook every 10 minutes. I mean, there's definitely that, and you know, you have to, it's, it's a discipline <laughs> practice in a way, but, but yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, and teaching also, I mean, I, you know, having Spotify, uh, you know, there to immediately call up an example when you're teaching a student, I think is really valuable, so. I think it uh, has both benefit and it's a benefit, and uh, for, it's great to be keep updated to what the world is today, if something happened, I think as a composer, you should know, because uh, we cannot totally cut off from our society. Whatever inspiration we have came from the society, came from the environment and the people. But when, uh, uh, when I compose, I do prefer to not to have uh, uh, internet or not to check email, because uh, uh, I don't know uh, how other people, but if something gets into my head, it takes me a long, long time to get it out. Uh, also, I'm the type, if I have something, even in the afternoon at 5 o'clock, the whole day I could not write anything. Because I always know, oh my god, there's something at 5 o'clock. You mean so you have to have a free day I to have write? To, I, I would prefer that. You definitely. too. Do you? I can't have a free day. Free morning. Free morning, okay. No free days for you? I have kids. A kid. What? <laughs> Everybody's got kids. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, yes. So. That's interesting. Oh, free days are important, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, um, oh, I don't know if it affects me one way or another, but I do, the one really positive thing is the availability of resource and be able to check stuff and listen to stuff. Um, and I, since I don't, I'm not prone to the addiction part, then I think it's mostly good. Oh, quit bragging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Tony? Well, I think business-wise, it's, uh, it's, it's become invaluable and actually has made uh, some things uh, possible that weren't, like self-publishing possible where it was almost impossible before. Um, but as far as on a, on a personal level, I mean, I do the same thing that David does, you know, where you, you're just, you're there, you think of something, you got it. But all I think it does is it makes it easier. It doesn't make it possible. I remember before the internet, right? We all still did it anyway. We did that, it just was a little more difficult, right? We got our, we got our butts to the library or we found the guy who had the score or we, made the calls or we did the, well, you know, you find a way to hear the stuff that you need to hear, you find a way to get your hands on the scores that you need to see, and we did that. Now it's just a lot easier. <clears throat> well, I was thinking, you know, I try to tell young conductors to just don't, uh, maybe this is a different, different dimension of the internet. I find that it's, it creates sort of a, this, um, a, some kind of competition though that's a little bit insane at least for conductors because suddenly one person gets a job or something you know and everybody freaks out and you know it's like this I don't know I find it so incredibly unhealthy I think I've managed to become successful simply because I didn't know what anybody else was doing you know and uh, so I just carried on I, I feel like it's so invasive I tell them don't don't check these things but 
Could I add one more thought to what yeah. you say? So, uh, I don't know, well, going through the student age, you know, we all look at a lot of other people's work when you write orchestra, you study every orchestra piece. Uh, but I think uh, for the past 10 or 15 years, I just feel whenever I'm writing something, I intentionally do not want to do the resources to uh, check out whatever genre I'm writing so that I don't get uh, sidetracked or distracted to the pool to some, some other people's work. So in that sense, maybe it's good to also uh, just focus and not be influenced by uh, yeah. other people. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Do you, did you have a question? Yeah? Yes, I'm not sure how to uh, phrase it. Okay. But I'm wondering about um, the relationship you, with you there and the composers. How it starts, what happens to you? Because that's the thing, you know the score before, but how does it come alive? And what's the collaboration process? Uh, sure. I mean, the the first I think the first step is uh, really for me to identify a piece that I want to perform or a composer I want to work with, and that takes many different forms. There are several publishers are here, um, and they share a lot of new composers' work. Uh, this is a destination for publishers, you know, because most uh, I mean many composers these days are self-published, but. There are some uh, major publishing houses that represent a lot of these composers. I, how many of you have publishers? You? Yeah, so you see the majority of composers have publishers. So the publishers will often come out here and bring you know, stacks of uh, scores and, uh, well now they don't even have to bring that and they just go online and look at it. But um, they'll say, well, uh, you might be interested in this or we have a new composer. So they're, they're always, and I receive probably 50 unsolicited scores every month. Um, uh, but, and I, I look at everything and I go through everything. And often I'll have my assistant, my assistant here, um, Alexandra, will go through all the pieces and she knows, you know, she knows what I'm looking for and, and if something looks like it's very, it, it's really beautifully, skillfully created, then she'll pass it on to me. And uh, then the next step, I mean, usually, I think I get to know most composers here at Cabrillo, and then uh, that translates into taking their pieces other places for me. Uh, but uh, I don't know, it's hard to talk about how the relationship develops. It's like, it's like friendship though, you know? You, I mean, for me, I'm, I, friendships take a long time for me to develop. It's slow, slow growth is sort of my method. So if people are interested in a fast connection, it's, I'm probably not their conductor. No, seriously, you know, it just takes you years and, uh, um, you know, I think also every time you meet again, you, you've changed uh, and, you know, I just see people for the second time and third time and each time you say, oh, what have you been doing and what's going on and, uh, oh, do, oh, and I have a piece I'd like you to hear and, you know, then they show me a piece or send me something and that, that grows and over the course of the week also, you get to know people working with the orchestra. I see how they interact with the musicians, and I, I don't know. It's a it's a full experience, but you can probably speak to it a little bit more. What do you think? Uh, I think um, th the great thing of uh, you know being in Cabrillo is it, it is a very conductor and composer collaboration setup. So from the uh, young artist program, you already see that seed is there. You know what we do, right? We, we pair the um, young composers with at least two young conductors. Each one has two conductors and one has three th that they get to work with during the uh, course of rehearsing their piece. So th that we're trying to nurture that. Yeah. And I mean, I, I will say this is almost every composer's dream to hear your piece done in the same concert by different conductors. How, how rare it is. Yeah. Uh, I never had that happen to me. So, um, so, and uh, I mean, with Marin, this is my second time coming back, and David came back uh, several times also, and there are many other composers coming next week. They also has been here and throughout the year. So you can see this track record of uh, how this relationship really developed. It is really a relationship, you know, it does take time. Uh, composer grow, you know, uh, I write differently, David write differently from our past, and Marin follow up with us and uh, uh, keep wanting to bring out uh, our new work uh, for the future. So I think this is a beautiful thing for you to also see how this relationship evolved. And we usually stay, yeah, that's nice. That's very well spoken. Well, you can come back. Um, <laughs> no, but I think also, you know, we stay in touch. I mean, maybe not, you know, 
every, every day, but uh, um, I, I think, you know, we keep track of each other. If somebody writes something new they think I'll be interested in, they send me or send Ellen a link, and you know what I mean? So it's, it's like keeping up with each other to see what goes on. And also the, the musicians in the orchestra, I don't know if the composers have had this experience, but they often will uh, take the pieces back to their own orchestras or to their own music directors and say, oh, this is a great piece, can you program this? So that happens frequently too. Well, may I speak about the collaboration for sure. uh, just a moment? The, um, you know, when you're working with, with Mary and I working together for the first time, um, and then so there's a moment, you know, the first reading where I don't, you know, I'm terrified. I don't know how this is going to go down, right? I've never worked with her. She's never, you know, and, um, but then all it takes is, you know, you know, the downbeat and I see her, I, you know, I, I watch her rehearsing for 20 seconds and I think, oh yeah, yeah, she gets it. This will go fine, <laughs> right? So you never really know what that's, whether you're going to have a, a relationship with the conductor as far, as far as the composer goes where you're going to have to, you know, try and help the conductor figure the piece out the way you want it, or whether it's like, oh yeah, yeah, they, they get it. Um, so it was, a, it was a magical relief for me. <laughs> uh, no, but no, that, that me, me specifically, right. So, Not all conductors get all composers. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so, uh, you know, sometimes they, they, like, they, they get your stuff and sometimes they don't. And that's okay when they don't. There's plenty who, who don't. You know. It's not just taste. It's, it's, uh, but I think, uh, I think also, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I always like uh, being close to the um, creators because uh, I'm not a creator myself, but that's my job is to somehow represent them. And so the more I can hear different viewpoints, the better informed I am when I come to do a Mahler symphony, because I'm understanding uh, the, the psyche and, the, you know, I, ha I think how hard it is to be a composer. I, I'm really glad I'm not a composer, because it, it, it's a tortuous existence. I mean, not <laughs> they, they all look quite calm today, but I, <laughs> I think it's it's hard work, you know, like being an author when you just get up and you have to write something and maybe you don't, you know, God, I don't know, that pressure, always hanging, it's every day, you know, it's one thing to be an instrumentalist where you have to practice every day. I mean, being a musician is really hard work. You have to, you can't, you can't take a week off. You really can't because then it takes you two weeks to get back in shape. I mean, as a player, and I imagine as a composer too, you can't really take tons of time off. You have to keep the thread going and you have to constantly be pushing yourself. And a lot of people that aren't involved in this kind of, these kind of um, disciplines don't understand that. Uh, that, you know, for me, studying scores, uh, you know, I, I, it's a joy also, but it's a big responsibility. You have to sort of keep at it. Um, every day, but I love also tearing things apart and putting them back together. And that's really a, a composer's dream, I think, is, is having their piece taken apart by someone with care um, and hopefully put back together in a way that's even uh, well balanced and, and you know, well, well thought out. So, and that's what I enjoy doing. So usually it, usually it works out pretty well. Yes, sir. Alexandra, who, who helps you? Uh, uh, She's waving now. Oh, so okay. She's my, my assistant conductor. Okay, oh, okay. So, so she, you say she knows what you, sort of what you're, what you want. And I was wondering how, you know, you have all these scores coming to you, uh, you know, all these things being submitted to you for the next year, let's say. It just seems to me a, to be an unbelievable thing. Of course, you already, you already have composers here that you could draw from, but I'm interested in the newness, in the new composers whose scores you get. And with all these scores, <laughs> I, it, with all these scores, I don't know. I'm starting to feel tired. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, the reality is, I think the reality is though, from the unsolicited scores that come in, I would say maybe, it's a very, very small percentage that I will pick 
Uh, but I do pick some of them. But uh, probably out of uh, 500 scores, maybe two, you know, that just come in randomly. I, it ends up being more, uh, more through publishers, more through other composers, often. Um, composers who have been here, Chris Rouse recommends many people to me, John Corleano, Jennifer Higdon, they recommend composers that either have studied with them or that they heard. I mean, uh, you know, it takes a generosity of spirit to do that as a composer too, but I think that's more, uh, or someone, a musician will say, oh, you know, will you have a look at this or have a listen to that? I think it's more like that. And, uh, you know, in every orchestra I, I'm at, I have an assistant conductor who is very, very helpful. Alexandra was actually my assistant at the Baltimore Symphony for two years also. So, um, you know, they get to know you and they kind of know what vocabulary you're looking, what language you're interested in. So, it, it, it is, it's a big job though. <laughs> let's see, let's go here and then I'll come over to you. Yes. Did you hear the question? Uh, do these um, do these composers feel they need to have a signature sound uh, to identify? Uh, maybe that's a. I think if you're trying to put a signature sound on, maybe that's a problem. But I think most composers end up having a signature sound if they're good composers. Is that? Yeah, we don't, I just want to not about me, but when I first walked in here for the first rehearsal, I wasn't sure of the ordering, and I thought maybe it was David's piece. Was supposed to be scheduled. But I walk in, I listen to him, and I think, God, this sounds just like Mason. And it was Mason Bates, actually. <laughs> so, right, so, so um, I can confirm that. Yeah, but, you know, so indeed, we all, of course, want that, but the path to that is, is, is long, and it also has to do with you, right? As a composer, I think you always feel, you know, and it's great when you get heard a lot, if somebody hears you once or twice, when you say you have a sense of Beethoven's style, it's because you've heard many pieces many times. And in your mind, you start putting together what it is that makes Beethoven Beethoven. And most of us don't. It just doesn't happen that way in terms of the amount of saturation with, with hearing stuff, unless you're listening online and watching stuff. So, um, so I think we, we, it's, it's hard for us to do, but, but um, we all want that, sure. I mean, I, I'll let everybody, all the composers speak, but I think uh, for me as a conductor, that's why it's important to build relationships with composers so that you hear them uh, you know, year after year and you get to to know their voices, and I think that's what's been special about being here for 24 years, is that you know there's certain composers, whether you, whether you have ended up liking them yet or not, I can't, uh, I, I can't. But they're, you know, my commitment to them is unwavering, and also trying to build that bridge for you, because if you know one contemporary composer, it's also a doorway to other contemporary composers, because you you're open to a new kind of language, but. Well, you said something uh, earlier about um, about if you try and impose uh, yeah. a certain style on, that's a problem, that, and that, that could not possibly be more true. Um, and I can actually, sometimes even from students, I can, you can hear that, where they, they're trying to do that. And, but the key is actually truthfulness, right? If you, if you sort of let that go, if you let what your um, sound is like, and just, you know, you write what is, what you want to hear, what is truthful to you, it, whether or not it makes any difference to anyone else, it doesn't matter. Then, then you will have a, that's the style. That's it. It just comes. The is there a style. moment though when you realize you have your own voice? You know, because usually you have to start by imitating. I, do you know what I'm saying? Is there a moment when, as a yes. composer? I think so. Yeah. Well, there's also a big variation among composers. There are composers who like. Monet, say, had a lot of similar output. There are composers like Picasso who deliberately have very varying output. Stravinsky is a great example of the, the Picasso version. You know, someone who was not, just wasn't happy doing the same thing again and wanted to do something completely different. And it takes a lot more listening to hear to Stravinsky side by side than to Brahms side by side and be able to say, oh, that's definitely Stravinsky. You have to know a lot about what he did and 
be kind of down to the fingerprint level to be able to know, oh, sure, that's Stravinsky, but it's not necessarily an obvious thing, and it's sometimes a deliberate choice on the part of composers to do, to depart every time. And there are other composers who like to stay in the same zone and, and develop it and really kind of grow that soil. So I would say that's a very good question and it's a question every composer might have to spend our whole life to figure that out. A lot of us won't be able to. But I think um, uh, it is important for composers to have our own voice, but your own voice is not something you could artificially, as what John said, to impose to it, right? So it, keep, it takes time to develop and take time for other people to recognize it. We are the worst people to say what our style is. Um, and and uh, uh, um, I mean, yes, we, we need to be critical to ourselves also. I mean, in, in my case, um, I do remember which piece I feel that piece has more my own voice in that. So uh, in my college, uh, I only keep two pieces uh, exist in the public, and all the other pieces I won't let it perform. I mean, I, I won't burn it like Brahms did, but uh, I just uh, don't feel that is uh, you know, enough quality to put it out. So maybe it's the quality, not the yeah. yeah, So I like this idea of the fingerprint. I mean, I think, you know, uh, at, for me as a composer, I, I tend to work in material that might seem quite different on the surface. But if you're listening to the harmony, you're listening to the voice leading, you're listening to the sort of, in some ways, the technical aspects, it's all the same. It's all me, you know. So um, I think Stravinsky is very much like that. You know, you can hear these very different pieces, but you hear this way this one chord is voiced, or this way that these voices move, and you're like, oh, that's Stravinsky, you know, so. Um. Who was it? There was someone here. Yes, go ahead. process because you see the rehearsals and they see the um, I think that the, they see the inside of what's going on and uh, I imagine that it could be very frustrating if you turn over your piece to someone who really either doesn't care enough or you know maybe for Jonathan I can imagine if someone who doesn't have a good internal pulse you know that could be something you know if you have a very rhythmic piece and you end up with a conductor who you know, should be doing a Strauss piece, you know, not a, not a groove piece. Uh, that could be very frustrating, I imagine. Is, is this kind of what you want to get into? It? Uh, well, that wasn't the question, no. Okay, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, no, the question was, have you ever been in that situation where you thought that, and then afterwards you actually liked it, or the audience really liked it, and you were surprised? I wish I could answer yes to this, because uh, <laughs> okay. uh, that would be brilliant. But uh, the answer is no, because it probably never got that far, oh, right? Boy. It never, you know, you, you composers spend a lot of time waving their arms around trying to get people to pay attention to them, right? So um, probably, you know, it, it gets close to the point where the person's almost to the podium with your score, but not really quite, and then you just can't really get that one person to, to, to be there with you. And it's not, you have to take it, um, you, you don't, you can't take it personally. Uh, it's not that I'm bad or that they are bad. I never blame anybody. It's the, it's just the way that's just not their thing. They, they want to do something else and I'm, I'm not speaking to them at that, at that moment. Um, there certainly have been plenty of times when I've wanted to, you know, rip the baton out of the person's hand, but, um, uh, <laughs> They're very, they're rare, and you can almost, you can almost, you can almost always learn. you as you say, you can almost always learn something from uh, a, a different interpretation of. of the Was piece. there another question in here somewhere? Yes. The question is, uh, um, 
the difference the difference between being a, an on a faculty and academic uh, an institution and being a composer. Sort of a I'll answer in a few years. This is my first job. I start next week. Yeah. <laughs> is everyone on faculty somewhere? I, no, I'm not. Yeah. Are you? Uh, are you? Yes. Where do you teach? Uh, I, I teach at Madness and uh, also SUNY Purchase. Um, I should say, I don't know, I, not everyone can teach. Mm -hmm. And not every great composer who can teach and not every great teacher who can compose. So that's the fact. Some people can do both. Uh, I, uh, I do feel it is a calling and, uh, uh, and I feel strongly uh, one should teach because uh, contemporary music is already a very side, you know, uh, not, not the mainstream, right? So uh, if we don't teach more younger generation, don't, don't, uh, they might end up be great composer, but some might teach their students. And so it takes a seed to, to start to spread. So uh, uh, that's why I say no matter how busy it will be, it's always good to teach. And also that's how keep ourselves young also, mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to exchange energy with younger generation and generation X, Y, Z and whatever out of the alphabet. So, um, yeah, I, I like it. I mean, I think part of it is also, for me, is about community. You know, I think that we as composers, and sort of as you were saying, we, we want to expand the community of people who like what we do. And part of that is certainly teaching. Um, doesn't necessarily mean teaching in the form of being a professor somewhere. Uh, it could also mean, you know, organizing a concert series, running an ensemble, starting a nonprofit. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that one can engage with various forms of outreach, you know, um, and I've, I've had the experience of doing a lot of them. I'm actually in a week stepping down from a position that Jonathan and I are trading this job. Um, so he's t taking over at Shenandoah and I'm gonna be joining Hong Rho at Manus. So I do teach, um, but you know, I think we, it's interesting to, to consider a broader definition of what that can mean, you know. Anybody else, where were we? Up there, yes. <clears throat> I was very much struck by the statement that Mr. Davis made last night. That he wanted to be remembered. And this process of being remembered is supposed to be very difficult. I mean, Beethoven had to play a lot of music before people came home seeing his melodies. And there's so many great Latin resources with thousands of composers around his own. And there seems to be about one of the things that we hear that the incredible passion and all these different devices and so on. But what's happened to the good old days when people would come home singing and all the emojis? We would have thought it's considered using that as a memory of the house. Well, actually, I think what we we're talking about when Mason asked, he was mentioning that something be that bits of music be remembered. I think he was referring specifically to within the piece so that in the last movement you would hear the, hear certain things come back. I don't think he meant in a uh, remembered for all time and eternity kind of way. Though that would be okay. <laughs> I don't know, if, if, I think if you do something to be remembered, that's the wrong motivation. I, I think, uh, I don't think Beethoven wrote anything to be remembered. I think he wrote what he had to write. Uh, and he responded to his environment always. I mean, that's the thing to remember is that uh, everyone's, everything's a response as one said uh, to the world you live in and uh, your experience in the world. And uh, I don't know, for me, a lot of these pieces get uh, stuck in my head and uh, for days and days and days on end. Uh, so I think they're quite memorable. I don't think it just has to be a melody that can be remembered, uh, a fragment. I mean, I wouldn't say that Beethoven V has a very good melody. It's just two notes. One, first one's repeated three times. Ba -ba -ba -ba. I mean, it's not really a great melody. And yet, it's a great idea. I mean, I, I do wish I had thought of it myself. <laughs> but, you know, that... That Macmillan last night, really, if it's just that thing, da ba 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 Really, I mean, it's two notes, and it's making me insane. It's still in my head as we're talking now. Now it's back, now that I thought of it again. But, um, you know,
know, I think uh, things that are memorable are, are things that, that resonate with people, right? And, and it feels like last night at the concert, a lot of things resonated. I, I think David's piece was uh, uh, spectacularly moving um, for people. I could feel from the audience at the beginning of the concert. And, you know, I think Jimmy, Jimmy McMillan's piece is very, um, it's transporting in a different kind of way. You know, for me, the way he brings the, uh, the church, the sacred element always into things, you know, it's something he's always thinking about. And, uh, and then Mason's piece was, you know, a different world altogether, this magical kingdom. So I, I feel like there, every experience is memorable and in its own important way. And uh, I, I just would urge people never to do things for, for those motivations. Just do things because your creative spirit makes you do them, right? Feels like it. So let's uh, maybe take a couple more questions and wrap it up. Yes, over there. Well, in our culture, um, we're not too strong on uh, pause and silence. And I wondered, um, although tonight, uh, I know that we'll, we'll hear some pauses, but uh, I wondered how, now that we're <coughs> more international and aware of of other cultures where uh, silence is found to be actually meaningful and nourishing. So I wondered how you're dealing with silence, perhaps more and more in your music, or a pause. So, so, uh, it, it, uh, are you saying silence and pause, or applause? Pause, pause. 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 So the question is really about, uh, about silence and uh, how that I guess, are you thinking of John Cage? I mean, what are you, are you thinking of just the world we live in? Yeah. Well, I mean, Sebastian, Sebastian's piece is all about silence tonight, that you're gonna hear his piece. And I think that's, you know, that's telling. I mean, there's nothing worse than going to a jazz club and hearing somebody fantastic play who forgets what silence is about. It makes me insane. You know, they can play a thousand notes and there's absolutely no, no uh, reference to silence, and silence is extremely powerful. But we live in a world that is rarely silent, <laughs> and certainly our, you didn't choose to be composers for silence, but. <laughs> but. But yeah, my piece has, well, two measures of music and one measure of silence, so actually by the, by the end, a pretty large percentage as opposed to silence, I'm sorry. Um, and, um, I like silence and, and great softness in a concert hall. It's great, but it's also very frightening because um, there's always noise. It's always that little cough that ruins the moment and so on. So, so there, there is this little thing where, where one wants to do it, but then there's also this factor of negotiating it. Um, and some composers make it their world to do, others, others don't. I don't in general, but this piece does have quite a bit of it, and I'm quite worried about it. <laughs> um, be fine. We only had the alarm last night. Did you hear that? The alarm going off? Yeah, that was unfortunate. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard in this uh, age we live in, I think, to actually capture silence. But when it happens, uh, especially with a full house of people, it's quite magical because everyone's almost taking the same breath. It's a beautiful moment. I had a teacher in grad school uh, talking specifically about electronic music, and he had a, it was a sort of class, people were showing their work, and one of the class, my classmates had this, this big section of silence in the middle of this electronic piece, and he said, you know, that's really interesting, but when you're dealing with electronic music, you have to create the silence. You can't just let it be silent, which is something I think about a lot, so the idea that it might not actually be silence. silence but that you are creating just like, you know, painting emptiness, you know. Um, how do you construct that using some sort of what is actually sound, you know, and create the illusion? I mean, I think being a composer is, we, we kind of try to be magicians to a certain extent, and that's, I think, one of the sort of magic tricks that is always interesting to, tr to pursue. It's, it's tricky, but it's something I've always been inspired by. I was at a um, celebration for uh, Terry Riley's 80th that Kronos stayed up in the city, maybe some of you attended, and there was this wonderful moment where they had asked Yoko Ono to send them uh, guidelines for a structured improvisation, 
And they were various sort of weather-related things, like a word. And one of them involved snow in some way. And the quartet had been making up various kinds of music. And for this one, they just didn't touch their instruments at all. They played them without touching them. And it was captivating. It was really the highlight for me of the concert. And <laughs> there was no silence. I mean, there was no sound except for, you know, of course, the odd rustling. But it was a really beautiful moment. But largely because the rest of the concert, you know, because it came as a surprise, because we were not expecting that. We were expecting some other kind of snowy sound, and the fact that there was no, it was the absence of the sound that made it exciting. Yeah. Uh, I want to add one more thing to that is I think also depends on what culture you're from and what tradition you're from. Uh, I, I remember very vividly when I have uh, some. Western colleagues came to China, that's where I was born and raised, and they saw some, uh, you know, theater of this, and they said, oh, why so quiet, so zen? I said, well, for us, this is normal, this is loud. So, uh, and I, I do think com comparison and contrast, um, in our Eastern culture, silence is not without sound. Silence is, is so quiet when a needle dropped on the floor and you could hear that. So through that contrast, we hear silence. Um, so at least to me, um, when I write music, I, I don't intentionally create ultimate silence, but the contrast, which uh, tonight you will hear that, that after all the noise, and you will really achieve that silent moment, although the music is still going on. But to me, in my heart, that is silence for me. Okay, that was key. Yes, one more. <laughs> Is this for the composers? Do you, do you consider contemporary music melodic? <laughs> yes. Okay. Is that your end or my I end? I do, yes. <laughs> I do. Yes, it's one of many features, one element in a list, but yes. But certainly, I mean, and it's, it's one of those things, some, some things are not, all are, and I would argue if you go to the past one, like the question about memorability to, there are pieces of the, in the past that are not melodic in the traditional sense either, but we tend to forget that because it's an incorporated language that we're familiar with. But there are, there are certain elements and sometimes uh, in, uh, it's just like a, a, a story, you know, sometimes the, there's, there's the development of a different aspect. So if something's more rhythmically driven, that becomes the leading Factor it doesn't have to be the melody. I mean, some pieces are melodically driven, but some are driven by the other elements, texture, rhythm, uh, harmony, orchestration. So uh, it depends on the balance of the particular piece, but there's, I think there's melody in everything. There's melody everywhere around us, always. One of the nice things about working now, as opposed to when I was in school 20 years ago, is that things are much less uh, there's, there's less uh, defined thing of what contemporary music is. It's much more about individual personalities, which is such a relief for all of us, because we feel that we just get to do what we feel like. And there are composers who are obsessed with melody and who do nothing but that, and there are composers who don't. So I think that though you might find some music that isn't melodic to your ear, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're all doing that or that we're all trying to do that. And you might turn the page and find another composer who's doing something really, really different. I'm not sure if melodic is the word you want to, the, the word you want to use though. I mean, I think by melodic, uh, you might be saying um, non-dissonant. I'm trying to think, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it's just about melody, maybe it's about access and uh, and also, you know, by melody, maybe we're thinking words too, text or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm simplifying the definition by considering it's that melody is something I whistle up while I'm writing beats or something. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, it depends. You know, really, I do. I'm I hum these pieces, so maybe it's just a difference in you know, what you're exposed to. If, if my 11-year-old, really, if he hears these pieces, that's what he ends up humming that day. You know what I mean? I think it's just a, just a matter of how, how our experience is. But 
Um, I hope you, that you all can come to the concert tonight. It's going to be a spectacular uh, performance, and we look forward to sharing it with you. And thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you to all my wonderful creators here at the table. Thank you. Thank you.